So, uh, Eileen, to introduce uh, today's speaker, who everybody knows, I'm sure. We're just snickering because the speakers are a little nervous. Uh, <laughs> so, it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, and these are always bittersweet moments because it's a celebration of someone who's completed their PhD and moved on to the next step, but at the same time, it's kind of a way of saying goodbye, and it's always hard. Uh, today's speaker, as you probably have figured out, is Tally Hammond who Tally's been here a little while. She transferred to Berkeley to finish her undergrad in 2008. And at the time, she thought she was going to be an English major. We quickly fixed that. I think she took animal behavior <laughs> her first fall here at Berkeley, and that was, that was it. She decided bio was the way to go. Turns out it was a pretty good decision. And Tally, as I think, as I run through her resume and embarrass her, I think you'll agree it was a good decision. And she's turned out to be a wonderful, productive young scientist. But Tally immediately impressed people here with how much she could do and stay on top of and stay organized. But while she was an undergrad, she worked for me in Tuco World, who was the head Tuco regular for a long time. She simultaneously worked with Roy Caldwell in his stomatopod projects. And my apologies, Roy, I hope you can see the Photoshop pod there. <laughs> So she was doing research in two different labs as an undergrad, which is relatively unusual, and doing it well. And she completed an honors thesis at the time she graduated here in 2011. But she went, came right back and wanted to start the doctoral program, and so I admitted her to work in my lab, and that's where she's been ever since. So the undergrad years, already highly productive. Um, just a few of the details and things to run through to convince you of that. Tally entered grad school with an NSF GRFP. She got an NSF D-Dig while she was here, as well as numerous other smaller awards, monetary awards, to support her research. Culminating most recently, she was named the recipient of the A. Brazier Howell Award by the American Society of Mammalogists and delivered a plenary talk at the annual meetings in Idaho last summer. It was really well received. Um, she's got five publications already out, three more in review. And I don't think I've ever been able to say this before. All of her dissertation work is submitted and in review. <laughs> so all the grad students in the room can like, <laughs> <laughs> the gold standard, right? Like I say, I've never been able to say that before. So clearly, Tally is highly productive, gets a lot done. She's now an NSF postdoctoral fellow at the University of Pittsburgh with Corey Richard Zawacki, someone we know well around here. And she's taken some of her talents for stressing animals that she'll tell you about today to frogs and is now busy stressing frogs. So <laughs> what it takes to stress a frog. Um, but in any event, I have to confess, and this is like the full disclosure part, the graduate years, when Tally first approached me about going to graduate school here, I don't know if you remember this, I do, kind of tried to very gently, diplomatically ask, you know, so do you think you're up for rigorous field work? Do you remember that? Yeah, yeah and, and you know, I, I don't know why I had that doubt about Tally, but I kind of did, I confess. Mm -hmm. Now I have to eat my words publicly, <laughs> because she had it. And so, you know, as, as she'll tell you about today, Tally's field work was, you know, backcountry Yosemite and those areas of the Sierra Nevada, where, you know, they're out camping for extended periods of time, pretty rugged conditions, no electricity, none of that stuff. And it was amazing. She's done an amazing job following up on some of the Grinnell survey work. I also have to say, Tally has done an amazing job of avoiding photo photos of herself. <laughs> that uh, everyone I got, she was either totally swathed in gear, mosquito netting, and all of that. And at first, I thought, well, you know, like like me, Tally's kind of fair-skinned; it might just be protected. But I've come to think more and more as she's evading something, oh, staying on <laughs> the limelight. But in any event, I am now publicly eating my words. Tally did an amazing job with a rugged program of field research that's generated some really exciting results that she'll tell you about today. One last thing, though, is some of you may know, but Tally has a whole other side, and that is she's actually very artistic. And she's become known over the last couple years for her ability to go to national conferences. This is from ABS, the Behavior Society, I believe, right? This is real paper. Oh, okay. <laughs> And live with her notepad, diagram, I've seen her do this, 15 minute talks like this, one slide, total catch everything in the talk graphically, and tweet them. And so she's now well known around memological circles as 
at Mammal Lady for doing these live. And you know, it's amazing. I've sat and watched, or watching her, not the talk, because she's, <laughs> and it's all there in one slide. And, and usually better represented than the speaker was presenting it. So, Hidden Side Italic. She's also very artistic and has a, a lot of uh, public outreach, educational activities going on as well, kind of built around some of her artistic interest and abilities. So now, hopefully, I've suitably done my job of embarrassing you and apologizing for doubting your field skills. And I'll turn it over to you so you can tell us about the things that you've learned and the amazing work that you've done. Thanks, Tally. All right. Well, thank you, Eileen, for that too kind introduction. Yeah, I remember when I came here in 2008 as an English slash philosophy major, and I just took animal behavior for fun and started working in boys' lab with the stomatopods for fun. And the second I heard Eileen's first lecture, I was like, what? This is something you can do? And for anyone looking for the right way to give an undergraduate lecture, go to one of Eileen's um, animal behavior 144 lectures. They're really just so clear and eye-opening and um, yeah, it's a great introduction to the field. Um, so yeah, I'll be talking to you today about my dissertation work on um, these two chipmunk species, uh, looking into some of their behavioral and physiological differences in an effort to kind of better understand why they've exhibited such divergent responses to climate change. I also apologize, I'm just getting over a cold, so sorry if I'm popping cough drops throughout the talk. Um, because this is my finishing talk, before I dive into the research, I want to just start by acknowledging some people and groups of people that uh, allowed me to finish. Um, when I joined graduate school, I don't think I really realized how lucky I was to be um, a part of the MVZ. I did do part of my undergrad at Berkeley, but I was more upstairs with the Tucos and Stomatopods than downstairs. Mm -hmm. And the museum has been an amazing place to work, um, not just for these the amazing biological resources that exist in those cabinets, um, or for the field notes, or the uh, evolutionary genetics lab, or the financial support, but most of all for the intellectual community here. And I think um, leaving Berkeley, I've really realized how unique uh, the intellectual community is here. I think most people are probably aware, perhaps some are, that in the MVZ, um, grad students are housed in offices with students from other labs, and I think that leads to really stimulating discussions and kind of a diverse intellectual presence that's pretty unique to the museum. So I'm very grateful to have been here and that you guys all let me do be one of the few weirdos doing behavioral and physiological research in a museum setting. It's been great. Um, many specific people to thank. Um, the, uh, where to begin? The curators, of course, for lots of help with logistics from everything from how to get permits to how to ship fecal hormone extracts across country lines. <laughs> unique questions that I don't think have been answered before, um, so I'm very grateful for that. Jim Patton for lots of talks about chipmunks. Um, Terry for letting me borrow and destroy a large number of Sherman traps. Um, Lydia for letting me do my weird fecal hormone extraction procedures in an evolutionary genetics lab, baking thousands upon thousands of fecal samples up there. Thank you, Lydia. Um, Melania for help with lots of things along the way, my committee, of course, my wonderful office mates and lab mates, um, Julie Woodruff, who I think I saw walk in somewhere back there. Hi, who's a huge influence on me during my undergraduate years. I'm grateful you're here. Um, and um, last but not least, of course, the wonderful Eileen Lacey, who supported me from before day one and definitely was a huge factor in making my dissertation something that's worth reading. Um, sorry, I'll be done with the cheesy thank you soon, I promise. Um, and last, I want to thank my field assistants. Uh, my dissertation was dedicated to my field assistants. I could not have collected so much data without them. I know at least one of them is in the crowd right there, Gordon. I'm not sure if anyone else is still in the state even, but I'm so grateful to these people for filling the work with joy and for letting me um, collect the amount of data that I did. And these are all amazing people. Many of them are now in uh, master's or PhD programs doing really cool work themselves. So big thank you to those folks. And lastly to my collaborators, uh, in addition to Eileen, uh, all of the endocrine assays <coughs> were done in the lab of Dr. Rupert Palm. And then these three folks, Taylor Burke Kirkpatrick and Dwight Springthorpe and Rachel Walsh, who some of you may recognize, all helped with various components of the accelerometer validation study that I'll be talking about. So I'll take a sip of water. Okay. So, quick outline, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Grinnell Resurvey Project um, and about how plastic mechanisms like behavior and physiology can fit into studies of environmental change. 
Uh, next I'll talk about a few methods I developed during my dissertation for looking at physiology and behavior in free living animals. And finally, I'll get to the more exciting stuff, um, looking at uh, these physiology and behavior and deploying these methods in a field setting on wild chipmunks. So most people here are probably familiar with the Grinnell Resurvey Project, but for any who aren't, I'll go over it in a nutshell. Um, Joseph Grinnell, a famous naturalist and the first director of the MBZ, he and his colleagues went out in the early 1900s to a number of sites in California and took really detailed um, surveys of these sites. Uh, they made large numbers of collections for the museum and also took very careful uh, field notes and field records. And this allowed scientists in the early 2000s, when they had the brilliant idea to go back out and resurvey these sites, to visit the exact same locations, control for things like trapping effort, and address the question in a pretty sound way of, of whether animals were living in different places then and now. And what they found was that animals are living in different places then and now. I'm going to zoom in specifically on small mammals in the Sierra Nevada, the central Sierra Nevada region. So in this figure, where each bar uh, represents the elevational range of a different small mammal species. And in gray, I've got their historical ranges. Contemporarily, a number of species expanded and a number contracted. And you can see there is kind of a pattern of species tending to expand or contract upwards in elevation, which is how we might expect them to respond if they're tracking their historical climatic niches and kind of moving up to avoid these um, warmer temperatures that now exist at lower elevations thanks to climate change. But clearly there's a huge amount of heterogeneity in how even just these small mammal species are responding to environmental change. And this is true not just for small mammals, but even um, amongst more closely related species like the two chipmunks that I study. So these are the species I'll be talking about throughout the talk. Um, the lodgepole chipmunk is Tamius speciosus. I'll be in red throughout the talk. Um, this is a slightly larger species, 50 to 80 grams, living at about 1,900 to 3,200 meters in the uh, Yosemite region. So their range ends about at tree line, although you can't find them above tree line sometimes. And they're a bit more of a generalist species than the alpine chipmunk, Tamius alpinus, which will be in blue throughout the talk. Um, they're smaller, a little less colorful, tend to live at and above tree line, and they're endemic to these high elevation um, alpine habitats in the Sierra Nevada. Uh, these species and a number of other chipmunk species that live in the Yosemite region have been focused on in um, older studies because they've got this interesting kind of um, parapatric, semi-sympatric uh, distribution along the mountainsides. And so um, many scientists have kind of asked questions about why a certain species range ends where it does. And so um, in some ways they're an ideal system for exploring range shifts in the context of climate change because some historical work has been done on them. Um, in terms of where the chipmunks are living these days, here are their <coughs> historical elevational ranges. Um, contemporarily, the alpine chipmunk lost a huge portion of the lower part of its range, and the lodgepole chipmunk stayed in pretty much the same place. So one kind of simple and reasonable hypothesis would be to say that, okay, the alpine chipmunk is more sensitive to, um, to climate change, to these warm temperatures that now exist at, at lower elevations, and so it's contracting upwards to avoid these. Um, spoiler alert, I'm, I'm sure we'll surprise no one here that it's not, the story won't be quite that simple, um, but still I think these species provide a unique comparative system for asking questions about why even when species are really closely related and actually living in the same areas, do we see such variability in how um, they're responding to changes in their environments? And a number of studies coming out of Berkeley and specifically out of the museum have um, focused on these two species now. So just to go over some of that work quickly, um, models have identified climate and vegetation as good predictors of Alpinus's range shift, and these factors have been unable to predict the lack of shift in speciosis. Um, diet and skull morphology have shown more change and more directional change in Alpinus than in speciosis, and genetics have shown um, increased subdivision and reduced diversity in Alpinus and no real change in speciosis. So kind of across the board, we've got this uh, picture forming of Alpinus as this more responsive species. Um, a species that along various uh, metrics of change is, is kind of more likely to respond to changes in their habitat in line with the changes that are occurring. And while I think it is tempting to focus on Altinus as the one that's doing something interesting, it's also worth pointing out that speciosis is doing something interesting too. They're experiencing the same climate change or the same types of environmental change 
and somehow are able to just cope with it without, um, without changing along any of these parameters. And so one question that came up for me was whether speciosis might be using plastic mechanisms like physiology and in particular behavior to cope with environmental change without having to actually move locations or change in any of these other ways. Um, the question of understanding rain shifts is an important one because rain shifts, including both elevational shifts like the one I've been talk ones I've been talking about, but also latitudinal shifts, are one of the major ways that we see organisms responding to climate change. Um, and this is true not just for the small mammals I've been focusing on, but across a wide range of taxa. We see a lot of animals um, shifting their ranges. And understanding range shifts is really a question of understanding how <coughs> organisms are affected by their environment and how, um, diff how variance in the environment interacts with kind of intrinsic limitations within an organism to shape uh, the niche. So I think the, the question of understanding range shifts is really a question of understanding the ecological niche and the realized niche. Um, so why am I talking about behavior in this context? Um, behavior is a flexible mechanism that can allow animals to respond to rapid changes in their environments. So for example, um, if we have a species that uh, used to be more active in the middle of the day when temperatures were warmest, um, as the world warms, if this is a thermally sensitive species with flexibility in its behavioral patterns, we might expect it to become active at cooler times of day if it has that flexibility. So in general, organisms with more flexible um, behavioral processes and other processes are thought to be less vulnerable to um, climate change and other types of environmental change. Um, but in addition to being a mechanism of response, it also can be used as a tool for understanding what animals actually care about in their environments. So by characterizing which factors are the most limiting of behavior, um, we can get a better understanding of why animals are living where they're living. Uh, similarly, it's a similar story for physiology. Uh, we all know that physiological limits can contribute to range limits. And again, understanding which factors are constraining of and predictive of um, physiological parameters can give us a better understanding of why animals live where they do. And this is mo particularly important for Tamius alpinus, um, as they're about to experience a kind of sharp upper limit to their ability to use range shifts to cope with climate change. They're going to hit the top of the Sierra Nevada mountain range. Um, and many studies now have shown that alpine species tend to be more vulnerable to environmental change and in particular climate change. So I've talked a bit about why, how behavior and physiology can fit into studies of environmental change. So the next question for me was how to collect useful behavioral and physiological data from free living chipmunks that are running around in the wild. And so as I mentioned, I'm going to talk now about a few methods that I developed during my dissertation and then later I'll jump into deploying these methods in a field setting. So for behavior, we chose to focus on activity budgets. Um, activity budgets have clear consequences for, for fitness. So if you're spending more time reproducing or more time looking for food, um, it should be, it, that should have obvious effects on your survival and reproductive success. Uh, this is what I found when I typed in pie chart squirrel activity. <laughs> um, historically, though, activity budgets have been really difficult to measure just because of the amount of um, manpower it takes to continually observe animals throughout the day and because you can affect animals by observing them. And so over the past decade or so, um, accelerometers have been increasingly used for this task. And these are tiny sensors. Um, they measure acceleration, usually in three axes of movement. And the idea is that different behaviors should have different patterns of acceleration. So for example, if this is our raw stream of acceleration data along these three axes, you might expect this first behavior to be um, kind of a moving in place behavior, like running, this high impact behavior here to be running. <laughs> Sorry, sorry eating before and then running, and then this kind of flat line here to be just a completely still behavior. And so if you can establish that there are reliable correlations between accelerometer um, patterns and behaviors, then in theory you can use accelerometers to collect uh, data from animals that you'd never observe at all. Um, up until recently, accelerometers have been too large to put on small animals like chipmunks, but I worked with Dwight Springthorpe, who is a, a PhD student here in the department that finished a class last year, um, and he designed and we built these tiny accelerometers um, that we can put on chipmunks. Uh, at the time of publication, they were the smallest that had ever been deployed on a 
free living animal. Um, they're less than a gram, so they're really tiny. They're about a gram and a half to 2.5 grams if you include the battery that we used, and the battery size is flexible. Um, and because they're so small, there are limitations, and I'll be talking about some of those limitations um, later in the talk. But before that, I want to just talk about the process of validating the use of accelerometers on chipmunks. So to do that, we brought chipmunks into captivity, and we fitted them with accelerometers, and they wore those um, while they were being filmed in an open arena. From this, we generated this data set where we have this raw, these raw streams of acceleration values that are labeled with ground truth behavioral observations. Um, and I won't talk too much about this next process, but my collaborator, Taylor Berg Kirkpatrick, then extracted um, a number of features, including just basic summary statistics, but also spectral uh, features for a transform data from, from this data set, and trained and um, tested a machine learning model uh, that can t read in this data and automatically generate labels for it. And then because we have the actual truth of what these animals were actually doing, we can calculate system accuracies um, for this data set. And so the idea then was to deploy accelerometers on free-living chipmunks and um, collect this raw acceleration data that means really nothing to a human observer and use this system to generate labels and come up with an activity budget for animals that we never actually observe in the wild. Uh, this is just to give you an idea of what the arena looked like. This is sped up, so they're not quite this fast, although so they are really fast. But you can see they're pretty active in the arena. They gave us a broad range of behaviors. And we had things for them to climb and food and nesting material. Um, and we also had a much longer runway arena where there's just lots of videos of me chasing chipmunks up and down a long runway arena to get kind of longer distance um, running behaviors. Uh, so from these videos, uh, we scored them with this long list of behaviors, which we ended up collapsing into much more coarse categories for the purposes of machine learning. Um, so we had in complete inactivity, locomotion, and then in-place movement. And so they are um, more coarse, as I said, but they're energetically meaningful categories. We also had a two-behavior system where we're just comparing activity to inactivity. So to jump straight to the validation results, our three behavior machine learning system got 82% accuracy. Our two behavior system got 90% accuracy. So not perfect, but comparable to um, a number of other labeling systems that exist out there. And certainly still useful for <coughs> collecting um, behavioral data throughout the day in a more efficient way. Um, take a sip of water. So one question I get a lot is um, whether the accelerometers affect the the behavior of the chipmunks, and I can't address that question explicitly, but we did look at stress hormone levels in individuals before and after they had been wearing the accelerometer for a few days, and we found that for both species there was no change in their baseline stress hormone levels, so that at least wasn't a bad sign about um, the extent to which these loggers might be affecting uh, the animals. It's not conclusive, um, but not a bad sign. Uh, so that's a nice segue into the physio physiological metric we chose to focus on. That was glucocorticoids, also known as stress hormones. Um, these are a frequently used physiological proxy. Um, they are essential for maintaining homeostasis in an organism, and so because of that, they're very reflective to and sensitive of environmental conditions. They're also potentially related to fitness, although these relationships are highly context dependent, and um, hopefully more work will be done both in chipmunks and other species looking at ties between glucocorticoids and fitness. Uh, we specifically focus on fecal glucocorticoid metabolites. Here I'm showing you the much prettier side of the fecal extraction <laughs> process. It's kind of kind of pretty in a way if you don't think about where it's coming from. Um, but fecal glucocorticoid metabolites are advantageous because they represent kind of an integrated average measure of stress hormones over many hours to days. Um, and they're also non-invasive, which allows for repeated sampling on the same individual. But in order to use them, it's important to first show that the fecal glucocorticoid metabolite levels are actually reflective of um, circulating changes in stress hormones in the blood. And so to do that and to begin to characterize differences in these species' stress responses in a more controlled setting, um, we brought animals into, captivities, into captivity. Here's a, a little chipmunk with his house full of nesting material. Um, they did pretty well in captivity, and we released them after a month. Um, so I'll jump straight to the data. In this figure, what I'm showing you is um, 
FGM levels over time, and this first line just represents the baseline circadian rhythm of FGMs for each species. So we stress them out in a few ways. Um, first, we used ACTH, which is just the hormone that's um, released to the pituitary or to the adrenal glands to stimulate the release of stress hormones. It's a standardly used um, pharmacological stressor. And here we saw a strong response in alpinus and a uh, similarly strong response in speciosis. So that was good news in terms of showing that the fecal samples are actually reflective of the circulating levels. Um, notably, alpinus' response was both fa faster acting and more sustained than speciosis' response. We also used handling as a more biologically relevant um, stressor. And here we saw a really strong response in alpinus, similarly strong to the ACTH, which was, was surprising that um, this stressor would be similar to this exogenously high level of um, ACTH stimulation. And for speciosis, we saw a much weaker response. Um, and then we also looked at baseline stress hormone levels in the same individuals when we caught them in the wild <coughs> versus when they had been in captivity. Um, this is before, their captive levels before any stress challenges. And here we found no change in speciosis and a significant increase in alpinus. So to summarize these captive um, study results, kind of across the board, alpinus appeared to be more responsive at least to the specific types of external challenges that we exposed these species to. So their response to ACTH, um, it was present in both species, but it was arguably stronger in alpinus than in speciosis. Their response to handling was much stronger. Um, their response to captivity was much stronger. So this is kind of lining up with, um, <coughs> with the results that I talked about earlier from the more kind of ecologically focused studies showing that alpinus often tends to show more directional, kind of predictable responses to changes in their external environment. <coughs> Okay, so I've been talking about methods and captive studies. Um, finally, I'm going to dive into the field work now. So I was very lucky to do my field work at, um, in Yosemite National Park and a number of sites in Inyo National Forest, which kind of surrounds the park. Um, I visited seven to ten sites per year. Uh, this is a little hard to see, but I tried to select sites where I could find in close proximity areas with only, with mainly alpinus, with both species, or with mainly speciosis. And because these speciosis sites were um, much more prevalent and easier to find, I also visited a number of sites where there was just speciosis. Uh, to each of these sites, I collected a variety of environmental data. We deployed eye buttons at about 75% of our trapping stations, and I also downloaded uh, weather station data from two weather stations in the park in order to generate information about hourly and annual climate. We did just pretty basic um, visual estimates of ground cover uh, to get an idea of the vegetation in the areas that these animals were living in. And then I downloaded bioclimb variables and made some very simple climatic niche models in order to have um, habitat suitability scores for each of the focal species at each of the sites. And all of these values were then used in models of activity and of glucocorticoids that I'll be talking about. Uh, these maps don't do a great job at conveying the beauty of the Sierra Nevada region, so here are some pictures of my lovely field sites, which I miss very much. Um, for those familiar with the park, this is May Lake down here, and at this site we would find alpinus up here in this um, alpine habitat without trees. We find speciosis down here in this uh, heavily, more densely forested area, and then this kind of sparsely treed area in between we would catch both species. And so I'm not going to talk too much about the habitat differences just because they're kind of exactly what I just said, um, where we have areas inhabited by mainly speciosis showing more littered up and down wood thanks to the higher tree cover, areas with mainly alpinus showing much more rocky cover since it's above tree line, and areas of both species being kind of in between. Excuse me. So a lot, of, a lot of work doing ground cover surveys for not too surprising a result, but at least it's been quantitatively established now. Their habitats are different. Um, the eye button data was a little more surprising. So what I'm showing you here are the mean daytime temperature values as recorded by eye buttons for areas inhabited by mainly alpinus, by both species, and by mainly speciosis. And what you can see is that the areas inhabited by alpinus, at least during the day, during the summer, are actually significantly warmer than the areas inhabited by both species or by speciosis. And if we look at how this plots onto the 24-hour cycle, you can see that it's particularly during these afternoon hours that alpinus only sites are warmer. And so this was surprising and a little counterintuitive to us at first because um, it kind of 
con contrasts with the story that I think is really easy to tell of Alpinus being this species that hates these warm temperatures that it's exposed to thanks to climate change and so it contracts upwards um, to avoid these warm temperatures. When it's actually living in close proximity to sites that are cooler, at least during the summer, during the day, um, and I even went back and looked at museum records and it's, it's moved out of sites that I have temperature data for that are, that are cooler than the sites that it's living in. And so this was our first indication that high summer temperatures might not be the most limiting factor for this species and perhaps looking at temperatures at other times of year um, could be really valuable for understanding how these species are responding. But I'll talk a little bit about why that might not be the case too. I forgot about this. This is just showing um, how mean daily daytime temperature uh, plots against the percent of each species. <coughs> Alright, so we know a little bit about the habitats now, and we're going to jump into the accelerometer results. So, um, <laughs> I'm going to be talking today about uh, acceler accelerometer data I collected at three of my sites. Um, we deployed accelerometers on eight to 11 individuals per species per site. Uh, they were programmed to turn on every 15 minutes and log 10 seconds of 20 hertz acceleration data and then take one light reading. So they were not continually recording and as I mentioned they're really tiny and so they just don't have the battery life to be able to continually record. But based on some pilot studies that we did, um, we thought that this would give us a meaningful idea of how their behavior was varying over the course of the day. Uh, from these individuals that we deployed accelerometers on, we recovered accelerometers from 15 alpinists and 24 speciosis. And on average, they were recording for 60 hours per individual. So these are sadly the only pictures that I was able to get of a chipmunk wearing the accelerometer, but at least it gives you an idea of how big the accelerometer is in comparison to the animal, so it's pretty small. Um, we just shave a little patch of uh, hair off of their back and then glue the accelerometer to their back using eyelash extension glue. <laughs> which I, for anyone thinking about getting eyelash extensions, I would really think twice about it. It's kind of terrifying that people are putting this right next to their eyes. It's pretty, pretty strong glue. Um, yeah, so I'll jump straight into the results. These are what the activity budgets look like. So in this figure, each bar represents an hour of the day, and it's split into the proportion of that bar that was, on average, spent completely still in this lightest shade, in in-place movement in this medium shade, and in locomotion in the darkest shade. Um, the black dots are light levels from the onboard light sensors, and so it's kind of just a good sanity check um, that these light levels match up pretty well with the activity levels that we're, we're seeing here. Um, kind of amazingly, this is not the first time this has been done, at least for speciosis. Um, this is a study from the mid-70s where scientists used, as you can see from these numbers down here, many, many hours of observation to get an idea of how active these individuals were at different times of day. And you can see it actually looks pretty different to, um, to the data that I collected. So they're seeing a sharp drop off in activity after about 7 a.m., declining to no observations after 2, or as we saw, a more stable um, behavioral pattern from about 6 to 3 p.m. Um, but there were a lot of similarities between the, the two species. It's hard to say whether this is due to a difference in methodology or potentially a difference in environment. They were working at sites very close to the ones that I was sampling, um, but always kind of humbling to be aware of how much work has been done before you, even on so specific a question. Um, but when we compare across these two species, what you may notice is that the activity budgets are kind of remarkably similar. And there are no significant differences in the proportion of time spent on any of the behaviors in any meaningful chunk of the day. Really similar activity budgets. But what we're most interested in is which factors are most predictive of activity, because these animals are experiencing different things. And so to begin to get at this, we generated a series of models um, to look at which environmental and intrinsic biological factors are best associated with activity in each species. And I'm not going to talk about all of them today, it's always kind of boring to hear about lots of models, but I will talk about one, and that's the model of daytime locomotion. So here, um, I'm looking at just the daytime hours. I'm looking at a binary comparison between whether animals were in locomotion or if they were not in locomotion. And we focused on that as kind of an energetically meaningful category that might be most likely to be um, responsive to changes in environment and things like warmer temperatures. So we used generalized linear mixed models for binomial data, um, and we had a starting model uh, containing the following variables. So we have 
some kind of biological ones, mass, glucocorticoid levels, um, reproductive status, and sex, some more temporal ones, time and date, and then some environmental ones. We have those ground cover data and eye button data, um, and then light levels from the onboard light sensors and co-occurrence scores. And these uh, data, in particular, the ground cover and temperature data were uh, pca before we ran these models to mitigate concerns about um, potential collinearity in the data. Um, so then we eliminated from the models any variables that were not explaining significant variance in the activity patterns we saw um, in order to generate a final model containing only, um, only, only variables that were meaningful to each species. Um, we also included ID and site as random effects in these models. So what we found for both species Time was important, the individual in question's glucocorticoid levels were important, and their reproductive status was important. For alpinus, we saw more intrinsic biological variables appearing to be important, um, including sex and mass. And for speciosis, more environmental variables popped up, including vegetation, or the ground cover surveys I mentioned, the co-occurrence scores, and the date. And then, maybe most interestingly, for speciosis only, um, we saw individual identity explaining a significant component of um, the variation in behavioral patterns, which was not true for alpinus. You can kind of see here, it's a little bit hard, hard to tell, but these are each site, and these are kind of average locomotion scores over the course of the day for each individual. And you can kind of see there's, there's more variance between individuals in speciosis than alpinus. So that was just the model for locomotion. We also made models for um, general daytime activity for afternoon locomotion for afternoon activity and kind of across the board what we found was that there tended to be more um, relationships between intrinsic biological factors and behavior in alpinus and more um, individual variability and more relationships between environment and behavior for speciosis and so I'll talk a little more about this later but in some ways it's suggested to us that speciosis might be um, a more flexible species behaviorally in some ways. I don't have time today to talk about the specific variables and how they related to, um, to different behaviors. I'm happy to talk about that later. I just want to focus on one, and that's temperature, um, just because that's kind of the one that we were generating the most hypotheses about. And you may have noticed it wasn't in the model I discussed. It usually wasn't in any of the models. And when it was, it was positive, so individuals were more active in warmer temperatures. So this, in combination with that fact that alpinus' habitats were warmer, again, kind of pointed towards this idea that high summer temperatures, at least in the years we sampled individuals, um, perhaps might not be the most limiting factor. Um, but we did look to the onboard light sensor data to uh, try to look at whether chipmunks might be compensating for these warm temperatures in other ways. So this figure is a li little difficult, um, but what it's showing you is the difference in average light levels between when animals were active and inactive. So if it's above zero, they're more active in shady habitats. If it's below zero, they're more active in sunny habitats. And you can see that for both species, they were more active in sunny habitats in the morning and evening. And this is true um, even if we split it out into morning and evening separately or smaller chunks of the day. They're more active in sunny habitats. In the afternoon, when you would expect there to be more sunny habitat available, we found that alpinus became significantly more active in shady habitats um, which was not true for speciosis. So some indication that alpinus might be using microhabitat selection to um, cope with the higher temperatures in its environment um, and kind of more generally highlighting the importance and value of using this kind of spatial data whenever possible. I'm still waiting for uh, GPS units to be small enough and affordable enough to put on large numbers of chipmunks. That would tell us a lot. Okay, to wrap up the behavioral section, um, Behavior, I think, has been increasingly incorporated into analyses of how and why species are more or less vulnerable to environmental change. And it's kind of a critical component of this idea of adaptive capacity, which is an organism's ability to cope with changes um, using flexible mechanisms, phenotypic plasticity, <coughs> but also dispersal and genetic diversity. And so our thought was that by characterizing the way that behavior can kind of respond to or mold to um, current, variation, current variation in the environments these animals are living in right now, that we might gain a better understanding of how behavioral flexibility might be used over a longer time scale um, 
to cope with environmental change. And what we saw was that speciosis is more general a species that hasn't exhibited a lot of strong responses to um, environmental change showed higher individual variation in behavior and showed behaviors that had more, um, more ties to environmental parameters. Um, and this suggested to us the possibility that speciosis might be in some ways a more flexible species. This could be a result of um, <coughs> there being currently existing um, more phenotypic variants in this species, could be a selection in the past for more phenotypic plasticity within individuals, it's hard to say. Um, but either way, it kind of lined up with this, this specialist versus generalist dichotomy that we see of um, specialist species tending to be less plastic in order to kind of enable these specialized phenotypes. Okay, so we've talked about the behavioral stuff now. I'm going to jump to the fecal glucocorticoid sample results in the field. Here our expectations were kind of just the opposite of the behavioral data. So we expected that alpinus might be more responsive to, that their stress physiology might be more responsive to external environmental variables, and that prediction was kind of informed by the captive studies that we did. And for speciosis, based on some historical work that has hypothesized that um, speciosis's range edges may be determined by interspecific competition, we expected that their stress physiology might be more responsive to species co-occurrence and population densities and things like that. So um, we collected fecal samples from uh, all the animals we captured just directly from the traps that they were caught in, and traps were cleaned in between individuals. And from these, we extracted glucocorticoid metabolites that were then assayed. And we did this work in three summers, so 2013, 2014, and 2015. We generated about 1,000 samples for alpinus and 2,700 samples for speciosis. So as far as um, stress, ecological stress hormone data sets go, this is a pretty significant um, sample size. And it was hard to figure out the best way to visualize how these stress hormone levels map onto environmental and individual variables. And so I'm going to start by just looking at some specific relationships between single variables. So for example, we can look at sex and reproductive stat uh, status. Um, it's a little hard to tell here, but in general, particularly for speciosis, females tended to have higher stress hormone levels, um, particularly reproductively active adult females, which it's not Super surprising as a lot of our sampling took place during lactation, which is a really energetically demanding period. Um, juveniles tend to have slightly lower levels than adults, and all of these relationships were more exaggerated in speciosis than alpinus. Um, similarly, we can look at how BMI, um, just a simple measure of um, weight over height over weight, or weight over height, uh, how that maps to the stress hormone levels. And here we saw a weak. Um, but very significant relationship in alpinus and a slightly stronger um, significant relationship in speciosis. So in general, we did see this pattern of biological variables tending to be um, more predictive in speciosis than alpinus. Environmental variables um, tended to show the opposite patterns. So here, a very weak but significant relationship between maximum daily temperature and um, stress hormone levels in alpinus, such that individuals have higher stress hormone levels at higher uh, maximum daily temperatures, no relationship in speciosis. Um, for herbaceous cover, which is known to be, um, or thought to be a more important um, food source for alpinus than speciosis, we saw a much stronger relationship in alpinus than speciosis. Um, we can also look at how stress hormone levels map onto different sites. So in these figures, what I'm showing you, uh, each circle represents an individual stress hormone level. The diameter of the circle is proportional to um, how high that stress hormone level was. And so I'm not sure how useful these pictures actually, or these figures actually are for understanding how um, stress hormone levels map onto habitat features. I think they do a good job of uh, showing the distributions that I talked about. So for example, at this site, which is Upper Cathedral Lake, we've got speciosis in red in these low elevation habitats. And then this kind of intermediate area where both species live, ramping up to these really high elevation habitats where it's just alpinus. And similarly at May Lake, speciosis down here at lower elevation, both species at this kind of mid-elevation. And then in these habitats, which are really alpine habitats, we have mainly just alpinus. Um, but that isn't what we always saw. We also have some more interesting distributions here. This site is pretty flat across the board. And we just have certain areas where there's only speciosis or only alpinus or both species. 
Um, this site is particularly interesting because over here in this area with both species, we also have a third species of chipmunk living, uh, the yellow pine chipmunk, Tamius aminus, and they were living there in very high densities. I got all of my captive individuals from this site right here and had no problem getting enough numbers um, in 2013 and 2014, and then in 2015 they were completely obliterated by the plague, which was confirmed by the Cal Department of Public Health, um, and I went there and caught like one chipmunk uh, the whole time. It was very sad. And interestingly, these sites, which are pretty nearby, did not experience that at all. So just some interesting dynamics going on at these sites. But all these kind of individual variable relationships are um, probably not the best way to look at these since there's relationships between different variables. So again, we used generalized linear mixed models to look at which factors were most predictive um, of stress hormone levels in both species. And here, um, we started with a slightly different starting model. So we had uh, biological factors, the number of recaps, the BMI, the reproductive status, and sex. I can see I'm running up against the hour, so I'm going to go pretty quickly through this. Some temporal variables and environmental variables, including the habitat suitability scores from the snitch models, and population density estimates from mark recapture data. Um, again, site and ID were random effects. Those were significant for both species. So was ground cover. And that was it in terms of similarities between the two species models. For alpinus, we found environmental variables being much more predictive of glucocorticoids, including those habitat suitability scores where they had a uh, negative relationship such that less climatically suitable habitat um, in those areas, individuals had elevated stress hormone levels. For speciosis, much more biological variables and very few environmental variables, sex and reproductive status, BMI, number of recaps, um, time, which could reflect a stronger circadian rhythm. Um, because this kind of uh, pairwise, or sorry, stepwise backward elimination of variables has been criticized in some studies, we also generated separate models where we have just intrinsic biological variables or just environmental variables for each species, the same set of variables, and then we compare the two models. And when we did that, for alpinus, we found that the environment only model was way better, and for speciosis, the two models performed pretty similarly. Um, because we collected data over many years, we could look at interannual differences in, um, in these relationships between stress hormones and, and environmental parameters that you would expect to change from year to year. And here we found differences in both species. Um, and again, because I'm running up against the hour, I'll just say that the relationships in alpinus, the differences were easily explained by interannual differences that we recorded in climatic variables and in vegetation variables. Whereas for speciosis, we have this kind of um, really long list that I spent way too long animating to look like a star wars. Um, but these variables were not really easily explained by any environmental factors that we measured. There's examples of directionality completely reversing from year to year. So all in all, um, more signs of these less stable relationships for speciosis between their responses and the direction of environmental change and for alpinus, um, environment was a strong predictor of fecal glucocorticoids, and the relationships that were there were pretty stable. Um, I know I'm running up against the hour, so if anyone has to leave, that's totally fine. Um, I'll go through this pretty quickly. Um, the reason I'm focus focusing on glucocorticoids is because they are kind of a proxy of uh, a physiological proxy. And there are certain groups of organisms that we would expect to do sorry, that we would expect to be most physiologically limited um, by their environments. And those include um, organisms or populations living on range edges, animals living in more extreme or variable environments, and more ecologically specialized species. So these types of organisms, in the face of environmental change, they're the ones that we might expect to be most limited by their own physiology. And alpinus kind of fits the bill on a lot of these bullet points. Um, arguably, the most of the populations I was sampling were range edge populations. They're also a more ecologically specialized species in contrast to speciosis. And in line with this, we found that they were more stress responsive to variation that they're currently experiencing in their environments. And so we're not arguing that the environments that they're living in right now are physio physiologically preventing them from inhabiting <coughs> them, um, but potentially glucocorticoids could be uh, used as kind of a signal of areas that where these species might be less competitive or might have some fitness costs. So I'll jump through the conclusions since I've already talked about this, but for speciosis, 
activity showed more variability between individuals and more relationships with um, environment, which suggested that they might um, be more behaviorally flexible in some ways and might have um, more relationships, more, their behavior might be more moldable to the environmental variation they're currently experiencing. Their glucocorticoids were less strongly predicted by environment, and the relationships that were there were less consistent, potentially suggesting that they're less stress responsive to the current conditions that they're facing. Um, the opposite was true for alpinists. Their activity was better predicted by intrinsic biology. There weren't strong individual differences, and their glucocorticoids are more strongly and stably um, correlated with environmental conditions. And so all in all, these results lined up um, to some extent with the differences that they've shown in range responses and um, other types of responses as well, and hopefully suggest that behavior and physiology are, are useful to include in assessments of species vulnerability to environmental change. I'll kind of jump through the future directions section and skip it. Um, but I'm focusing on frogs now, so <laughs> a completely different taxonomic group, um, looking at how uh, chytrid might be impacting the behavior and physiology of a few species that are kind of differentially impacted by the disease and are um, experiencing these catastrophic declines that we see in California and in Central America. Um, so pretty different, but I'm still measuring stress hormones and weird substances. So these are, this is saliva, still making animals do weird things in captivity. I have a bunch of frogs waiting for me in, in Pittsburgh right now. Um, but I was very grateful to do my dissertation on the chipmunks. I've already uh, sent in an application for ACUC approval at Pitt to catch some of the chipmunks at the field station. So it's not over yet. I may be um, doing some work on the, the eastern chipmunks. And with that, I'll finish up. Thank you all for listening. Thank you to the MBZ, and I could take any questions. few people may need to scoot out. Should we give a second for those who need to run and then we can take questions? And everybody fails. And Jim can't wait. <laughs> He's got, yeah. Uh, I, I guess I'm not surprised at all by your difference. So, okay. And for the following reasons. Alpinus is an open country animal that you recognize, but it's also derived from an open country animal minimus. Mm -hmm. And those are the only two open country chipmunks. And so it's got a long phylogenetic history of dealing with temperature in an exposed environment. And the second thing that I would uh, suggest, and I made this argument to Craig years ago, is that I think alpinus range retraction is a result of the common landscape phenomenon that you see across the Sierra Nevada in the high country, and that's densification uh, of trees as a result of presumptively changing climate. Uh, so that the open country that used to be present at Tuolumne Meadows where Alpinus used to be is no longer there. Yeah. And so I wondered if um, so the Wieslander uh, plot data are available uh, and they've been and those plots have been resurveyed, has anybody ever bothered to look at increased densification at those sites where these animals were previously present and just use that as one of the of the you know, the basic environmental parameters in your models? Not, I, not, not that, that I know of. Yeah. yeah. That would be a good next step. Do you think that winter temperatures are important? Oh, I think that winter temperature yeah. is absolutely important. And that's, and that's probably the, the increase in just driving the increase in densification. Oh, I see. Uh, because the, the pines don't get killed back the uh, over the winter time and for the chipmunks. Yeah. But, it, I mean, as I said, just this general you know, correspondence between open country heritage mm -hmm. and maintaining that heritage yeah. uh, is an important aspect yeah. for alpinus, but not for speciosis because it's been a dense forest yeah. animal forever. Uh, That's very true. If I had another dissertation, I would do yeah. winter stuff. I would look at the Wieslander <laughs> surveys um, for sure. Yeah, I didn't get it. I was rushing through the end and wanted to talk a bit more about winter temperatures in there. I just remember when we were up at, at um, uh, Upper Cathedral Lake working on those things, uh, there was a graduate student from Davis who was up there doing redoing the Wieslander plots. And I know for there, and I also know those plots are available for uh, for Tuolumne. Yeah. And I, I mean, we could check, to my knowledge, yes, they were redone, but I don't think much was ever done subsequently analytically with well, those data. Well, um, I'm trying to remember the graduate student's name. Um, Tom, uh, I 
remember anybody. Who did the uh, uh, Jim's uh, graduate student, Dave, who worked on hybridization and uh, um, SMT? Tom Devitt, his wife, um, <laughs> who was a uh, PhD. <laughs> uh, Susan Cameron. Cameron. Um, Susan Cameron. Yeah. yeah. Um, did, did some of the resurvey re um, of the Wieslander plots in Tuolumne Meadows, and they published a paper on that change. Um, but I, yeah, I don't think I don't that, that next step the, was overtaken. But we could definitely yeah, anyway, see that. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, I'm not surprised if, if yeah, your temperature, the temperature findings yeah. at all. Other question, Dana. Is, is there any literature talking about like in, uh, at least for chipmunks, like they increase their stress hormone? Like, what's the consequences? Like? So that's a major question that I glossed over a bit, and I think looking at um, there's a lot of literature not on chipmunks specifically, but on other species um, that have found fitness ties mainly between baseline stress hormone levels rather than like acutely elevated ones and fitness, but there's also a lot of papers that show the opposite or that it's really context dependent, um, like whether they're in the breeding season or not. So um, something that hopefully I can use these data to look at is because I've sampled across the course of the season um, the same individuals, it might be able to look at relationships between reproductive status more explicitly and stress hormone levels and also looking at individuals from year to year. But that's definitely something that needs to be explored more across the board. I thought there was another, yeah. yeah. I was wondering if you could say anything about the uh, traps um, influencing the stress level before they poop. I can, yes. Um, so from the captive studies, we found that the fecal sample levels increased 24 hours after the initiation of the stressor. So thankfully, um, the trapping did not influence the stress hormone measures. It did influence when we caught individuals like one day and then we caught them the next. And I controlled for that in the models by including a variety of glucocorticoid metrics, like their first capture, their average level, um, things like that, and then I PCA those. Also, uh, I, I was wondering for a long time uh, where small, uh, ranging rodent populations get their salt nutrition from, and if that influences their ecology at all. I was wondering. Um, I don't know the answer. Do you know? <laughs> <laughs> do you know? Matt does some work on that, right? But it's more how to deal with high how salt concentrations high underwater stress. Yeah. yeah. I mean, some of these taxa don't drink free water, and so it would have to be coming from whatever they're eating. But maybe licking yeah. rocks or something. I don't know. These there are guys, no rocks to lick. There's lots of yeah, rocks. Yeah, these guys have lots of rocks. Yeah, yeah. 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 So many great yeah. licking yeah. rocks. Yeah. 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 Um, they do drink water, at least in captivity, and I've seen them do it in the field a few times. But, um. Yeah, sometimes streams have salt dissolved in them from a deposit. Yeah, maybe that. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah, Amen. I just was wondering about the ones that you had the accelerometers on, you mm -hmm. had such detailed data, when, even if you can compare like their mass at the beginning versus their mass at the end and relate that to all of the data you have in between. Um, like whether they lost mass? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I didn't, I looked at that and most of them were, I did weigh them at the start and the end and most of them, it was like all plus or there was no pattern really. Um, and I also looked at whether certain individuals had increased stress hormones at the end and there, was, there wasn't there was a pattern, as I showed you. For alpinus, there was a, a non-significant increase. And for the alpinus individuals that showed more of an elevation, I think they tended to be um, less active, as I recall. Um, but yeah, with the weight, and with the body mass, too, that was, I was hoping to use the body mass index. I was hoping to use that as kind of a fitness metric. <laughs> but yeah, I need to look into that more. There was another hand up, yeah. Yeah. It was a great talk, um, and I, I guess I was just curious as to whether you had data on behavioral plasticity of diurnal activity times for the low elevation species. Did you have any species that actually demonstrated sort of going from a unimodal to a bimodal pattern if they were in a warmer environment? So, or did that I, didn't happen at all? Yeah, I may be misunderstanding your question, but wouldn't I need a like an initial time point to compare to? Uh, or just looking at variation, you said there's more like variation in these species. Were there any species that um, demonstrated 
a bimodal pattern of Not activity? Not really. It was pretty, for speciosis, it was pretty variable from individual to individual. So um, these are just locomotion scores. And if you look at the general activity scores, they're a little more stable. But you can see how different the different individuals are and how they're locomoting throughout the day. One caveat to looking at speciosis, for example, at their lower range edge versus their upper range edge, is that I was sampling pretty high elevation sites, so I don't have, I don't think I have any accelerometer data. I have glucocorticoid data, but not accelerometer data from the, the tail end of their range. But I was just wondering if, you know, maybe plasticity in, in their uh, activity periods is the same between these two species, but you have one species that moved into and I think those temperature differences that you showed are even, they should be even more pronounced because you're getting direct solar radiation. Yeah. So they could be 10 degrees higher than yeah. what you think. So essentially, they have the same amount of plasticity, they just moved up, so maybe there's more like dispersal plasticity or anything. They just yeah. moved into, they have a proclivity to move into these areas that happen to be a physiological trap. Yeah. Um, I don't know, that's really interesting. Yeah, that's a couple of them. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Well, I think it's safe to say, if nothing else, Tally has demonstrated it's complicated, right? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Tally.